job again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to announce that uh, Gabriel will give a second lecture. Uh, Gamma oh. Thank you very much again. So I have to start this second lecture by going back a little bit to the end of the last lecture, which was very confusing because there was a, a battle between my brain and my hand, and it was the hand who actually won this battle. So in my head I had QP, and what I ended up writing was ZP all over the blackboard in the example of the elliptic ordinary curve. So, of course, at the end I got this question, okay, but how is it possible that the elliptic ordinary curve over ZP can be classified by only one parameter? <laughs> and, of course, I couldn't answer this because in my head I had QP, and in that case it is true. So, in the example from yesterday, well, I guess the only example that I gave anyway, uh, you have to take, you have to work with VP of E instead of TP of E, and so with QP instead of ZP. But there is an explanation for this battle, the fact that everything I did yesterday was at the integral level. Right? I classified ZP representations of GQP. I didn't even tell you what is the classification of QP representations of GQP, so it was kind of natural to go over it with ZP. But I have to mention that the problem with ZP and TP of E seems a lot more interesting than the problem with VP of E. <laughs> Write down explicitly the Phi Gamma module of all TP of E when E is an elliptic ordinary, a good reduction, uh, ordinary reduction, uh, but over ZP now. So this was uh, one confusing point. I hope it's clear now. So. With this uh, modification, everything I said yesterday, or at least I hope, is, uh, is okay. Uh, second remark is that the hair complex that I defined was not a complex. Because, of course, I messed up the two maps. So I'm giving now the correct definition, which is very similar to the one from yesterday except that I interchanged gamma minus one and phi minus one. So with this new definition, this is really a complex, and this is the one that computes the cohomology of the Galois representation. And finally, so I only, it seems that I only made three stupid mistakes yesterday, which is actually not that bad. Usually I make a lot more, so maybe this lecture will be better from this point of view. Uh, it was... Maybe you should make the second Uh, sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No chance to make this correct, <laughs> yes. Okay, and the third one was about the convergence of a certain series. We had something like sum of phi to the n of f, which converges in zp double bracket t uh, if f is in t times zp double bracket t. So. I think I didn't write this down, but I probably said that this is convergent for the P or T addict topology. This is wrong. This is convergent for the natural topology of this ring, right, which is the P and T addict topology. The problem being that phi to the n of T, this is 1 plus T to P to the n minus 1, and this is not convergent for either the P or T addict topology, but it is convergent for the P and T addict topology. So now it's fine. Okay, so um, in Jared's lecture, we introduced a, a certain class of representations, and I will only be interested in the crystalline ones for today. Actually, the, the RAM ones are extremely inter interesting. I will probably tell you how you can compute the D, D RAM of uh, some representation in terms of the Phi Gamma module. But I would really like to give you the example of crystalline representations. And for instance, to answer the question, how do you recognize on the Phi Gamma module whether a representation is crystalline? How do you compute decrease of that representation? And something which I find a lot more interesting, knowing decrease of a representation, of a crystalline representation, how do you compute the Phi Gamma module? So this is for today. Well, uh, yesterday, I have to go back a little bit to what we discussed. We saw that we have a an equivalence between ZP representations of GQP and et al. phi gamma modules 
over this ring OE. So OE here is the ring of power series, sum of a n t to the n, where a n is in zp, and it goes to zero periodically when n goes to negative infinity. So uh, I would like to promote this to an equivalence between QP representations and some et alpha gamma modules over some other ring. And you can guess what will be this ring. Well, this will have a name. It's called E. And it's just OE, and I invert P. In other words, this is the function field of OE. Right? And then you have uh, an equivalence of categories between QP representations of GQP and et al phi gamma modules over E, except that now you have to be a little bit careful when defining what an et al phi gamma module is, because it's not the obvious definition. Every time I defined et al phi gamma modules, the condition that it is et al was that the image of Frobenius spans the whole module. Or in other words, the linearization of Frobenius is an isomorphism. This is no longer the case if you take uh, for E. Right? This is not going to give you the condition of being et al. And the problem is that QP representations have stable lattices by compactness of the group GQP. So in some sense, you should have an analog of the existence of stable lattices on the Galois side, on the phi gamma module side. And so it's natural to impose that there should be some stable lattice in your phi gamma module preserved by everything, and which is an et al phi gamma module over OE. I mean, the existence of such a, a lattice is not automatic. So to make things simple, I can just define phi gamma et al of E uh, in the following way. I just take E, I tensor over OE with D over all possible D in phi gamma et al of OE. And then I really get an equivalence of categories. This issue of being et al is going to reappear today when we discuss Roba rings. Again, the, def the obvious definition of being et al is not going to be the correct one. So I, al I already mentioned uh, this Roba ring. Well, and I already told you yesterday that the goal of this thing is to classify representations in terms of some periodic analysis objects. While here, you have power series which do not converge anywhere in principle. Because I impose this condition that the coefficients should, van should go to zero when n goes to negative infinity. But I didn't say anything about their behavior, behavior at infinity. So for instance, I cannot just evaluate this function at any value in principle. If you try to compute f of 1, you get nonsense. Because a n may not go to zero as n goes to infinity. Right? So what we are going to do today is to isolate a smaller ring inside this one where you can actually evaluate functions. So you'll have really analytic functions defined on some analyte. So this is exactly what the Roba ring is. You have the unit circle. And the Roba ring consists of those analytic functions in some analysts close to the boundary. Right? So I will call this R. This is the Roba ring. So to make it clear from a topological point of view, this will be the inductive limit of a sequence of rings. Yes, so yesterday I only had finitely many rings, as you could notice. Right? Today I really will have to work with infinitely many rings at the same time, which is always very pleasant, of course. So I will have all these rings E, 0, R, N. And if you want things to get really confusing, there are at least four or five different names for <laughs> exactly the same ring. I will try to avoid giving those names. Uh, but they have all kinds of names. For instance, B dagger and QP, B dagger R and QP, or any variation of that. You can invert 1 over Rn or anything like this. So just forget about those. I'm just taking for today one notation. E0 Rn, this is the ring of analytic functions on the analyst defined by the condition that the absolute value of zeta p to the n minus 1 should be less than the absolute value of x uh, 
and this should be less than one. So this is something which is really close to the boundary, right? And as n goes to infinity, you really go very close to the circle, to the unit circle. Because this, value, this norm here is just p to minus 1 over p to the n minus 1 times p minus 1. So when n goes to infinity, this goes to 0, and so you go to 1. Right? And you can easily see from this definition that this is an increasing sequence of uh, rings. And each of them has a natural topology because this is the ring of analytic functions on some region uh, analytic space, which is not an... Uh, well, which is not an affinoid, right? Because you have strict inequality here. But, of course, there is a definition of the topology. This is a Frechet type topology. And the Robar ring is going to be an inductive limit of Frechet spaces, which can make the topology pretty uh, non-trivial. For instance, you, there are three submodules of rank 1 inside R, which are dense. So, Rn is this one. You can rewrite this in terms of valuation, and then it becomes 0 less than Vp of x less than or equal to Rn. So one very important element in this ring is this T, which already appeared in Jared's talk, but in a very different context a priori. It was some element of B Duram plus, which was a uniformizer there. So this t is the log of 1 plus t, so by definition, it's the sum of this series. And this is really in R. Right? This converges on the whole open unit disk. Uh, and for instance, exercise, this is very surprising. t times R is dense in R. So when you deal with these issues here, things can get really crazy from, from the very beginning. Okay, so this is the Roba ring. This is the guy that we are going to work with today and replace this field here, which is not very interesting, with this new Roba ring where you can actually do piadic analysis. So, uh, well, you can imagine that if I want to replace E with R, I need to have some actions of Frobenius and Gamma on R. And it, you, you just take the definitions that I gave you yesterday namely phi of t go is equal to 1 plus t to the p minus 1, and gamma of t is 1 plus t to chi of gamma minus 1. And you can check that this, is, this really induces an action of gamma and Frobenius on the Roba ring. And the actions commute. And one important thing, which is going to come again in a more general context, is the fact that if you look at this, uh, rings here, E0, Rn, well, they are all invariant under the action of gamma, but they are not at all invariant uh, under the action of Frobenius, which is something like t to the p. So Frobenius is going to send this one into the next one. So gamma preserves each E0, Rn, but Frobenius applied to E0, Rn is contained in E0 Rn plus 1. So you decrease the domain of convergence by applying Frobenius. Of course, this is a very standard uh, thing. I will not mention, even though this is extremely useful in the theory, there is also another operator, which is called Psi, which increases the <laughs> domain of convergence. But uh, since I'm not going to use that operator, I prefer to avoid saying anything about it, but it really plays a crucial role in the, in the theory. So now we, I have just defined the trivial phi gamma module over R, right? R itself with this action of Frobenius and gamma. So let me make a definition. Phi gamma of R, so this is the category of phi gamma modules over R. So be very careful to the fact that I do not say et al. here. Is the category of finite free R modules D plus a Frobenius from D to D, which is phi semilinear, and as usual, inducing uh, an isomorphism between 
R tensor PRD and itself. So this is simply saying that if you look at the matrix of uh, Frobenius in some basis, in any basis, you get an invertible matri matrix. That's all it says. Uh, plus a commuting and continuous action of gamma. And again, gamma is going to act through semilinear operators. With respect to the action on, of gamma on the ring of coefficients R. Oh, there are some traces from Jared. These are not the normalized state traces, I guess. <laughs> okay. So this is the category we are going to work with. At some moment, I will define what a tal phi gamma modules of a Roba ring are. But for now, let's work with the larger category. Um, what can we say about these guys? Well, one example, just to see that this encodes more information than Galois representations. So let's take now delta from QP star into QP star. So note that this is really QP star and not ZP star, like yesterday. So this is not a unitary character. In particular, it does not correspond to, in general, to some Galois character. Uh, then I can define a phi gamma module called R of delta. So this is just free rank one R module with some basis E, where the Frobenius acts by multiplication by delta of P and gamma acts by multiply, multiplication by chi of, well, delta of chi of gamma. And this is an object of this category. And you can check, even though this is not really uh, obvious, that any object of rank one is of this type. Note that in this case, you no longer have any equivalence of categories, so you cannot just work with these objects via some uh, Galois characters. Here, you really have to, to do some, some work in order to prove that any object of rank one is of this form. So this is one example. This is a very important example, of course. Uh, for instance, in piadic Langlands, we are very much interested in what we call triangling representations. And those will correspond to some metal phi gamma modules over the Roba ring, which are successive extensions of objects like this. So understanding su successive extensions of uh, such modules is actually quite important. Um, OK, so we have this category of phi gamma modules. And now let me tell you that we have an analog of this property. So you see the Roba ring is an increasing union of rings, which are stable under the action of gamma. And Frobenius acts by shifts, in some sense, sends one at level n into one at level n plus one. You have a general statement about uh, phi gamma modules in this category. There, you can always write them as inductive limits of some canonically defined objects, which are modules over these rings E0, Rn. So let me state this as a pretty easy proposition and leave you as an exercise. Any D, so for any D in phi gamma R, there exists some N of D. And for each N greater than or equal to N of D, some canonical uh, E0RN submodule uh, maybe D sub N or well maybe to emphasize the similarity of with E0RN let me call it D0RN this is the notation that Colmes uses uh, inside D such that, well, the natural map from robot tensored with D0RN into D is an isomorphism. And, well, I guess each D0RN is stable under gamma. And 
Frobenius of d0 rn is contained in d0 rn plus 1. So in the case of the trivial phi gamma modules, of course, d0 rn is just e0 rn. So very often this reduces problems uh, concerning phi gamma modules over the Roba ring to understanding compatible objects of this form. Okay. So now since I said that I'm looking for some equivalence of categories between Galois representations and some objects in this category, I would like to have at least one functor going from Galois representations to, let's say, phi gamma modules over the Roba ring. And this is really not obvious because if you remember, you had this E, but I said that it really has nothing to do with this Roba ring. Right? So you need to find something inside E which is related to the Roba ring. Right? How do you construct this E dagger? This is the ring of overconvergent elements. Well, you can think of this just being uh, objects in QP double bracket T 1 over T. In other words, Laurent uh, power series, but with infinite <laughs> coefficients in both sides. Uh, which lie at the same time in E and in R. Right? So in other words, E dagger is just the intersection of these two inside this uh, stuff. That thing may not be a ring. Yes, this is not a ring, right? There is no obvious multiplication here. But, but the intersection of the two has a meaning. <laughs> and it is a ring. And it's actually a field even though this is not obvious. So, in other words, you can define this one as being bounded functions. And now it's really clear that this is a ring. Bounded functions in the Roba ring. Okay, so the way to go from Galois representations to phi gamma modules over the Roba ring is to go from phi gamma modules over E at all once, go here, and then, of course, just tensor with R and get the phi gamma module over the Roba ring. The big problem is here. How do you descend something which is defined over some ring, which is rather complicated, to a ring of actually analytic functions which are moreover bounded? So this is one of the main theorems of the, of the theory. And it's due to Charbonnier and Colmez. I gave a, a very beautiful new proof, which is more in the spirit of uh, perfectoid uh, spaces and the perfectoid equivalence. Uh, but it's, it still requires quite a lot of very non-trivial uh, estimates about the action of gamma. Uh, so the theorem says the following. For any d, which is an etal phi gamma module over E, there is a largest uh, E dagger submodule well, actually, sub-vector space, but anyway, E dagger vector space, D dagger inside D, which is finite dimensional, uh, stable under Frobenius and gamma. I could even stop here. And this could even be called a theorem, because this is not really clear, right? You can consider all the finite dimensional sub E dagger vector spaces of finite dimension, which are stable under the action of gamma. It's not clear that there is the biggest such object, but it is true. And now the real content of the theorem and the map from E tensor E dagger to D is an isomorphism. In other words, D dagger is big enough to span your phi gamma module. So this theorem is called the overconvergence theorem, and it says that all Piadic Galois representations are overconvergent in this sense. 
So the way that Cormes and Charbonnier uh, proved this theorem uh, is very much inspired by Tate's computation of the Galois cohomology of CP. So Jared explained in the first lecture that you need some very precise estimates on the action of the Galois groups appearing in the tower. Uh, and you also had this normalized state traces, which allowed you to descend from the completion of uh, the cyclotomic extension downstairs. Uh, so all these kind of techniques are used to prove this theorem, but you have to replace CP by a lot more complicated period ring, which sits inside this uh, A tilde, I guess, 1 over P. So there is a very big uh, ring of overconvergent -conver uh, objects inside this one, and that plays the role of CP. And using the same techniques, you, get, you end up proving this theorem. So I'm not saying anything about this because the proof is very uh, technical. But this gives you the way to go from Galois representations to Etalfi gamma modules. Because now you have, you get a functor from QP representations of GQP into phi gamma of R. So you take V and you send it to robot tensored over the over convergent ring with D dagger of V. Or I should call it D of V dagger. This functor is not an equivalence of categories. And now you need to define the analog of et al, phi gamma modules. Well, you can simply say that something is et al if it comes from a, a Galois representation, and then you get an equivalence of categories. Well, you still have to prove that this functor is fully faithful, which is not obvious, right? Because you are tensoring with a very large ring here, roba over E dagger. It's not difficult to see that DO, V goes to D of V dagger is fully faithful, because you can recover D from uh, D dagger, but it's not obvious that when you tensor with some bigger ring, you get a fully faithful functor, but it is true. Right? So I could define phi gamma modules, which are et al, just those which are in the image, and then we get an equivalence in the usual way. But there is actually a much more conceptual way of defining et al phi gamma modules over the Roba ring. Namely, if you remember, when you classify isocrystals over a perfect ring, let's say algebraically closed, there is a diodonet manu classification for those. And there is a notion of slopes, there is a harder nara simkan uh, fil filtration uh, formalism, and so on. And it turns out, by a very deep theorem of Kedlaya, which is really at the very heart of all this theory, that you have a similar diodonet manu uh, classification for phi modules over the Roba ring. And once you have that, well, you have the usual formalism of semi stable objects, pure objects over a given slope, and so on. And you can define et al phi, mo phi modules over the Roba ring to be those of which are pure of slope zero. That gives you a conceptual way of seeing uh, et al phi gamma modules over the Roba ring, which is independent of Galois representations. And then you can check that they are really equivalent. So let me state this as a theorem, which is obtained by combining the work of Kedlaya and what I have said so far. Uh, QP representations of GQP are equivalent to et al phi gamma modules over the Roba ring. So maybe I should say that even though I stick in this lecture to GQP, as Jared did in his lecture, this is only to simplify notations. You have an exact analog of this theorem for any extension of Q, any finite extension of QP, even though you still have to do some work in order to define the proper Roba ring over that. <laughs> Uh, that extension, but you can do all this and you still have this kind of equivalence of categories. But I should emphasize that contrary to, to the ring E, uh, in this case it is very useful to work in the larger category of all phi gamma modules over the Roba ring. Why? Well, there is this very nice uh, theory of triangle in representations which was uh, developed by Colmez. And the observation is that, well, certainly harder Narasimhan formalism gives you some, some conditions that has, have to be satisfied by sub-objects of, uh, let's say, an et al. gamma module. They cannot have uh, any kind of slope. They must have some 
there, there is a, a certain condition on the slopes. But that is not totally restrictive. You can just take sub-objects which satisfy that condition. And so irreducible objects in this category, or equivalently irreducible objects in this category, can actually become reducible in the larger category of uh, Figama modules over the Roba ring. And that's very useful because the reducible guys you can try to split into successive extensions of characters for those ones you actually understand the Figama modules. And so you can turn, in some sense, irreducible representations here into reducible Figama modules if you just enlarge your category of Figama modules. That was an extremely beautiful and very powerful ide idea which is constantly used, for instance, in Pierre de Glangland's correspondence or in the study of eigenvarieties. So really, when you work with the Roba ring, it's actually a very good idea to work here. But of course, you still have to remember from time to time that your objects do have some integral structure. Okay. So now I would like to make the link with Pierre de theory. So Jared int introduced a certain number of uh, period rings and a certain number of uh, adjectives for Galois representations being Hodgdate, Durham, Crystalline, and so on. And at the end of his lecture, Carol asked, okay, how do you recognize that on the Figama module? Well, there are a certain number of comparison theorems that allow you to read all those invariants given by Piadikoch theory. None of these theorems is easy to prove, so I will only uh, give you the, the results. The, the results are actually surprisingly easy to state. The proofs are always uh, fairly hard. Uh, so let's see how to recover the quiz. Well, this is one of the easiest results to state and one of the hardest to prove. So let's take V to be any. And I really insist on that, not crystalline, a priori. Any piadic representation of GQP. So I have this uh, D rig of D. I forgot to call it, to give him a name. So let me define it right now. It's just the base, base change extension of uh, D dagger V to the Roba ring. Uh, so here's Berger's theorem. decrease of V, which really makes sense for any Piedi Galois representation because you can just tensor with this decrease ring and take invariance under the Galois group. So you don't need any concept of crystalline representation to define such, such object. This is really isomorphic as, let's say, phi module over, uh, well, over QP in this case. It's isomorphic to D rig of V I have to invert this T element, which I defined at the beginning, this log of one plus the variable, and I have to take invariance under gamma. Note that in our case, gamma is just ZP star, because I'm working with GQP. So you notice that I did not say anything about filtration here. Right? There is a priori no obvious filtration on this object here. Well, it turns out that you can define one. I will explain when I go to DRAM. So the co combination between this theorem and that give you a way to recover the crease together with its filtration. Well, I think the only uh, statement which is not that hard to prove here is that this is really a finite dimensional QP vector space. <laughs> and well, it's, of course, it is stable under Frobenius. Uh, Frobenius is injective, so it has to be an isomorphism of the, on this vector space. And that's all you can say <laughs> with that kind of argument. You really need to go from decrease to some D-rig. So you have to relate this decrease and the Roba ring. And of course, you go up in the tower to this very big overconvergent period ring. And then you do some decompletion process there. You construct normalized state traces. So there's a lot of work. You need to construct some other period rings, some analogs of, uh, of the algebraic closure of the Roba ring. And you do this sentate formalism, which was formalized by, by Colmes and which is very powerful now. And you end up comparing these two objects inside some very big ring that Berger calls B tilde dagger ring. 
1 over t tensor v. So a priori, this object, which has nothing to do with this one, will live in this for some huge ring B tilde dagger ring, which I do not want to define here. So in some sense, this isomorphism can be even promoted to some equality inside this very specific object. OK, so that's uh, the comparison isomorphism of Berger. And now the question is very simple. If you know the Figama module, well, you can compute the invariance if you see if it has the, the good dimension. And if it has the good dimension, then your representation is crystalline. Otherwise, it's not. And you can say a little bit more. I'm not saying, of course, that it's easy to compute the invariance under gamma, right? But for instance, if your representation is triangling or something like this, what well, is going to be because by some Devisage argument, you just have to go back to your rob of delta and compute invariance there. So in practice, if you work with triangling representations, things are quite nice. Uh, moreover, if V is crystalline, uh, we have an isomorphism between rob of 1 over t tensored over QP with decrease, which is compatible with all structures, uh, and rho of 1 over t tensor d rig of v. Well, you can just call this one d rig of v 1 over t. So what does this theorem tell you? Well, it tells you that if you know decrease, you can compute this guy, which is a Figama module over the Roba ring, and you can recover d rig of v up to inverting t here. So there is still some process, because you see here, if I know decrease as a phi module with no filtration whatsoever, it tells me that I can recover this one. In other words, if I forget about the filtration, all I get is this object. So if, you, if I really want to get d rig, I have to invoke some extra structure, which is the filtration on decrease. Good, so now I'm speaking constantly about filtrations. I have to give you the recipe, which allows you to compute DRAM and uh, then the to, to promote this to a way to recover the rig of V out of decrease. And in the end, I will give you an explicit example. For instance, what happens if you take a super singular elliptic curve over QP? In this case, it's not difficult via the comparison isomorphism that Jared mentioned to actually compute decrease of that because you have to compute some crystalline cohomology. And normally, geometers know how to do this. Uh, so you will know what is decrease. You will know the filtration because you can also compute the RAM cohomology. So you, you know what are the, the corresponding uh, jumps in the filtration. So basically, you will know this. And you will also have the filtration. That will give you the rig. And after, once you have the rig, it will be not very difficult to find inside even the integral Higama module. All right, so what about the drum? Well, here the story is a bit more technical. I have to go back to this definition of the Roba ring in terms of these rings of analytic functions. Here I really need to work with the evaluation of these functions at roots of unity, more precisely roots of unity minus one. So recall that we have this fixed compatible sequence of roots of unity, one, zeta p, zeta p squared, and so on. Well, if I take some function in E0 rn, I can certainly evaluate f at zeta p to the n minus one. Because by definition, my function is analytic in the corresponding domain, and so this makes sense. And this will give you some element in QP of mu P to the n. Let me call this one just F sub n, make notation shorter. So this one makes sense. I can do the same thing with the whole derivatives of F and take successive derivatives. I can still evaluate at zeta P to the n minus one. And I can package all this information into one single object, namely a formal power series. So can define 
Frobenius minus n of f. So for now, you should just take this one as just a symbol, Frobenius minus n. You can actually give a meaning to that if you work in this very big ring that Berger constructed, but just take it as a symbol. This will be f of zeta p to the n exponential of small t over p to the n minus 1. And this also makes sense now as a formal series in one variable small t with coefficients in f sub n. And this really remembers all the information about the values of the derivatives of f at zeta p to the n minus 1 by some Taylor expansion argument. And here comes the connection with Didram. Well, a priori, this is just a formal variable, t. But if I take any formal power series in small t, I can think of this small t as being my t in B plus Durham. And the corresponding series will converge in B plus Durham because small t is a uniformizer in B plus Durham. So any power series here converges in B plus Durham. So I can actually say that this is a subring of B plus Durham. So I have a map uh, from E0 Rn into B plus Durham, which actually factors over some smaller subring, which is just power series in this small t. But now I see really this t as the log of the Teichmüller of epsilon in B plus Durham. OK. May I ask why Fn is contained in B plus Durham? Why Fn? Yeah. Oh, actually, even QP bar is contained in B plus Durham. You see, B plus Durham is a complete discrete valuation ring with residue field ah, CP. Okay. Hansel's lemma allows you to lift uh, everything. To, yeah, you, you have QP bar inside B plus Durham. So, in particular, Fn leaves this way. What is not continuous? Yes, this is not continuous. So that's, my, that's what I was going to say right now. It turns out that even though that, con that inclusion is not continuous, this one is. So I mean, the corresponding map here will be continuous. Yes, so this is a continuous inclusion. And it's actually GQP equivariant. So this is part of some very general process of localizing phi gamma modules over the Roba ring and going to bid run. So I leave as an exercise to check that this is continuous, but you have to be very careful what topology you put on B plus drum. This will not be continuous for the T-adic topology. I mm, no, actually, I think it will even be continuous for the T-adic topology on B plus drum. But usually, the, the canonical topology on B plus drum is really not the T-adic topology. Right? So I prefer to weaken it to some canonically defined topology on B plus drum. But I don't want to go into to topology on period rings, because when I'm less than two meters away from the blackboard, my brain is not working. So definitely, <laughs> I will mess up topologies in any way. I prefer to put the, the weakest or strongest one so that everything is continuous. And for that one, everything will be continuous. So in general, one can define for any d in phi gamma, not even et al. Oh, well, I, here I will take et al of r, a map, well, let's say a continuous uh, what do I want? GQP equivariant? No, let's say a continuous embedding from D0RN. We call that this is this canonically defined object, which is very much like E0RN, into B plus Durham tensor V, even there. Actually, it lands in a much smaller subspace, but it doesn't matter. 
where V is such that D rig of V is D. That gives you a way to go from et alpha gamma modules over the Roba ring to the theory of bid run. And now finally, I can further shrink this and define an object. Yes? GQP acts uh, through the quotient, which is gamma, and gamma stabilizes uh, E0 Rn. Yes, so this acts on the left-hand side via gamma. Thank you. So define an object which was introduced by Fontaine uh, by some rather different methods, by using the same Tate arguments, but for B plus Durham instead of CP, he developed a theory of B plus drum representations, and he ended up cooking some differential modules out of, out of those. But you can recover that from phi gamma modules, so I'm giving you just an alternative definition of what Fontaine did. So this is just Fn double bracket T, and you tensor over this map for B to minus N with D zero Rn. Right? So this is naturally a module over this one, and now I see this one as a module over E0 Rn via this embedding phi to minus n. It turns out that this map, the natural map coming from this embedding here into B plus Durham tensor V is still, well, it's still injected. So this one naturally sits inside B plus drum tensor V. So in some sense, all the objects that I constructed so far live in this big B plus drum representation. Uh, yes. There is still an action of gamma on this d plus diff n, because you have an action on, of gamma on both sides of the tensor product. Everything is compatible with gamma. So gamma acts on d plus diff n. And now here's the theorem. I guess this is due to Fontaine, let's say. But in this version with phi gamma modules, you can find it in papers by Cherbonnier Colmez. So I think that this, is also, this also works for any piadic representation. But just to make sure, let me assume that, B, that V is Durham. I'm pretty sure that it works for any. Then for all i in z, feel i of D Durham of V so recall that this d drum of V is obtained by tensoring V with b drum and taking invariance under the whole Galois group. And this was a filtered vector space, so it makes sense to talk about field i. And this is just t to the i d plus diff n. Uh, and I take gamma invariance, and this for any n big enough. And in particular, the right-hand side is independent of the choice of n. And you need to, che to, check, uh, to take n big enough, because if n is small, you don't have any control on d0 uh, rn. They are not maybe non-zero or anything like this. But you know that when n is big enough, d0 rn is big enough. So it controls everything. And then this theorem tells you how you compute d with all of its 
So what I did so far is to tell you how you compute decrease, how you compute the DRAM out of the Figama module. Now I will do the opposite. I will tell you how you reconstruct the Figama module out of decrease. So reconstruction of the rig. So let me assume that V is crystalline. Well, uh, we saw that in this case, we have a certain comparison isomorphism between roba of 1 over t tensor decrease and roba of 1 over t tensor d rig. So now the question is, how do you recover d rig inside this object? Well, let me consider the very simple case, which is actually already not trivial. Take the trivial representation. How do you recover R from R of 1 over t? So the question is, if I have a function in R, how do I know if it's a multiple of small t? Okay. Well, what was small t? It was log of 1 plus big T. So you know the zeros of that function. So the natural condition is, of course, that f is vanishing at all the zeros, or at least at all but finitely many zeros of small t. So let me state this as a proposition. If I have f in R, then f of zeta p to the n minus 1 is 0 for all n sufficiently large if and only if t divides f in R. Good, but this is what? This is p minus n of f mod t. Right? Because by definition, this was f of zeta p to the n, e to t over p to the n minus 1. So if I take t equals 0, I get exactly f of zeta p to the n minus 1. So the necessary and sufficient condition is that phi minus n of f lands in t times fn double bracket t. Perfect. Now I can tell you how you recover d rig out of d rig of 1 over t. And it's really a formal consequence of this. So let's say this theorem. d rig is just z in d rig of 1 over t, such that phi minus n of z lands in d plus diff n for all n big enough. And this is very nice, because now, in the case of a crystalline representation, I know what is this guy. It's just this one. So when v is crystalline, So what I'm trying to do now is not only tell you how you will recover the rig out of decrease, but also how you can prove the colmes fontaine theorem. This is Berger's proof, actually. The original proof by Colmes and Fontaine was actually very difficult via some quite complicated uh, analysis of decrease. Uh, Berger found an absolutely amazing proof, which is totally natural if you think about it, purely in terms of periodic analysis. So if V is crystalline, we get uh, that D rig is those Z in roba of 1 over T tensor decrease such that phi minus N of Z belongs to, well, field zero of Fn double bracket T tensor decrease for any n big enough. This is obtained by combining everything I said so far. <laughs> right? But that gives you the way of recovering d rig out of decrease together with its filtration. Because the filtration is encoded in this tensor product filtration here. <laughs>
And the very good news is that now you can forget about decrease, forget about your Galois representation, take any uh, phi module here. This makes sense. So you get the functor from, let's say, filtered phi modules to, uh, well, to some objects. It turns out that it actually lands in the category of phi gamma modules over the Roba ring. And moreover, the weakly admissibility condition, well, you can guess it corresponds exactly to being et al on the phi gamma module side. And that's not a difficult uh, computation. The, the equivalence between weakly admissibility and uh, et al on the, Galva, on, uh, on the Roba ring side is just some consequence of general formalism about for, uh, harder Narasimhan filtrations. The difficult result that you have to prove is that you really get some uh, phi gamma module, that it has the correct dimension, that the functor is exact, that it is compatible with everything you want, and then you just invoke some general machinery. But this is not very difficult. This is really purely piadic analysis based on the structure of the Roba ring, because this is an extremely concrete object here. Even though you have some filtered uh, isocrystal here, well, just take some functions which have a lot of poles, of course, at roots of unity minus one. And this is a very concrete condition. This is just saying that they vanish at some, with some multiplicity at some points. And that's it. So you are studying really some very concrete objects. So let me say this will be the last thing. Unfortunately, I don't have time for the super singular elliptic curve. But then, then it's really a very nice and interesting exercise. Take your favorite super singular elliptic curve. You don't have many choices. The result will not be dependent on anything anyway. So you take your favorite uh, super singular elliptic curve. You know decrease with its filtration. Do this computation here and you will end up with some nice formulas for the action of Frobenius and gamma on the corresponding uh, object. And you will see that you get some analogs of this log function, which are the log plus and minus, which you can see in the work of Pollack on piadical functions for super singular elliptic curves. All right, so the theorem is that this is due to, Ber to Berger. Uh, there is a functor, well, the functor Uh, D goes to the set of Z in Roba of 1 over T tensor D such that phi minus N of Z lands in field 0 of Fn double bracket T tensor D for all N big enough is exact from, and it's a tensor product functor from filtered phi modules to phi gamma of R and D is weakly admissible if and only if the corresponding object, how to call this one, uh, M of D M of D is a top. So this really easily implies, and I should say that it's also fully faithful, it easily implies the colmes Fontaine theorem. Because now you have an etal phi module, phi gamma module. You know it comes from a Galois representation, and that is the one that you are looking for. Um, but it all, uh, actually, Berger goes even further you can ask, okay, what is the image of this functor? I do not impose weakly admissibility. How do I characterize the image? Well, I will leave that for, for you to go and see his web page and see the corresponding paper in asterisk. Uh, I can only tell you that it's related to, um, to differential calculus. So you have these modules, d plus diff n. You can see them as uh, differential modules for the action of gamma because you can actually differentiate the action of gamma on those. So you get some uh, differential equations. And the condition is that those differential equations have enough solutions. Yeah? And that is the image. Okay, sorry for going over the time. <laughs>